Professor Franz Vonderdunk holds the Harvey and Susan Perlman Alumni and Othmer Chair of Space Law at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's LLM Program on Space, Cyber, and Telecommunications Law. He is an internationally renowned expert in space law who has been working in the field for over three decades. He has written more than 200 articles and published papers, given more than 300 presentations at international meetings, and served as a visiting professor at 30 universities and academic institutions across the world on subjects of international and national space law and policy, international air law and public international law. As of 2006, he is the series editor of Studies in Space Law, and in 2015, he published the first comprehensive handbook of space law, and in 2018, a major research collection entitled International Space Law. We're extremely fortunate to welcome Professor Vonderdunk to this year's conference as a keynote speaker for his presentation on international law and the military use of outer space. Professor Vonderdunk, thank you so much for participating today. The Zoom is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I hope that everyone can hear me and can also soon see my first introductory slide. So unless I get a sign of something else going on, I assume that is the case. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, the organizers of this conference, the United States Air Force and Space Command for inviting me to keynote on the international law and the military use of outer space. At this conference, which I dare say addresses issues which are going to determine the future of humankind spaceful, uh, peaceful um, activities in space for perhaps decades to come. I'm also happy to see a number of our star alums of our uni unique Nebraska program in the room these days. And I'm sure that they are going to provide the leadership uh, tomorrow for the issues that we are going to face inevitably. As I always used to teach them, the first question that lawyers always should ask is, what exactly are we talking about? So I will start by defining the three concepts that form the title of my talk. First about outer space. I think we can all agree it's the area above or beyond the Earth's atmosphere, wherever that may exactly be situated. If you ask the scientists, they will come up with various different answers to that question, so that's not really helpful. But one may in the legal field perhaps discern a convergence on an altitude of about 100 kilometers where airspace gives way to outer space. This is not generally accepted yet. Uh, I will not go into many details, but I think it's uh, safe to say that somewhere in the range between 50 and 150 kilometers altitude, indeed outer space begin. And everything above 150 kilometers without a doubt is occurring in outer space. As for the second term, military use, of course, that is usually set off against such things as non-military governmental use or civil use. And then a third prong of space is commercial use thereof by the private sector. Um, but we are going to focus on military use. And military has been defined in many respects with regard to arms, although it's important to realize that it's not just about arms. This is a quote from uh, Wikipedia, uh, and whether you like this one or another authentic and sensible one, it is important to realize that it is more than just about arms. Now, finally, as to international law, of course, we're talking about public international law, not about private international law. And when it uh, comes to the subject of today, there are really two different sides to it. On the one hand, we have a legal regime, a body of law, which deals with activities in a particular area called outer space, which we summarize by the notion of space law or outer space law. On the other end, things unfortunately are a bit more complicated. There are at least three different legal domains of relevance. The broadest domain is that of all military activities, which in terms of space and the law applicable thereto includes such issues as reconnaissance satellites and the use thereof. Within that realm, we have the activities actually involving arms, uh, which in the legal sense include disarmament treaties, non-proliferation treaties and things like that. And then within that, in turn, we have the smallest domain, if you will, which we commonly know as the law of armed conflict, which basically, which basically deals with the use of arms. I know that the, the borderlines between these various domains are fluid, are malleable, are often difficult to determine in great detail. 
I know that there are many issues and scenarios straddling these domains, but I think it's still important to keep the differences between the two, the three in principle in mind. For the sake of time in this talk, I will mainly focus on LOAC, although from time to time, I'll also address the issue of military activities. And of course, ultimately, we're talking about the area of overlap of these two, which I would call the law of armed conflict in outer space. I will first go through each of these two different regimes in general terms, separately, briefly analyze what they would or could bring to the table in terms of the overlapping area before homing in on that middle area and the overlaps that these two regimes create with all the resulting overlaps, gaps, and other problems. So starting with space law, it is a conglomerate body of law of many uh, individual uh, details, but I think it's fair to say that the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 is the most important element thereof. It has been ratified by more than half of the world's states, including all the major spacefaring nations. And in addition, it is generally recognized to, con to reflect customary international law. So it's fairly and squarely providing the legal framework for all activities in outer space, including military ones. Several elements of the Outer Space Treaty have been elaborated by three later treaties, which go by the colloquial names of the Rescue Agreement, the Liability Convention and the Registration Convention, and each of those will play a minor role in my talk as well. Now, what does this core of outer space law bring to the table in terms of armed conflict? The only real article of relevance here is Article 3, which provides that the UN Charter, at least in principle, applies to outer space. So what does that mean? Article 2, paragraph 4 provides for the baseline prohibition of the use of force against the territorial integrity and the political independence of a state. And obviously, if space ever gets involved in such a use of force, then it is by that same token outlawed. Conversely, once you are entitled to defend yourself under Article 51 of the Charter, then obviously the use of space technology in the context of that self-defense is automatically allowed as well. And the same applies to collective uh, action under the UN Security Council's guidance. Further than that, we may generally conclude that, outer space, that Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty also includes other relevant treaties or even customary international law on armed force to the extent that they determine so themselves. And the, the most important example is the Partial Testament Treaties, which already by its own token, token states that it's not allowed to undertake any nuclear explosions in outer space. Another example is the 1977 NMOD Convention, which prohibits environmental modification techniques and the use thereof in outer space as well as anywhere else. That's not really much. So I'd like at this point to draw the uh, line a little bit broader and address the broader issue of military use. Still, we are stuck with only a handful of articles. Going back to the same Article 3, since it applies international law in general to outer space, that includes also any law on military activities. International law in general includes the ITU regime on the coordination of satellite frequencies and orbits, but tellingly, this regime does not formally bind military operators. Obviously, they will do well to, to take a good look at whatever is going on in the ITU context, but legally, because white noise is white noise, even for a military operator, but strictly speaking, they are not bound by that. Article 3 also in general states that space activities should promote international peace and security, which at least provides a general boundary to what military uses are considered to be appropriate and allowed. Beyond that, the other main article is Article 4, which doesn't provide much by way of uh, limitations to the military use of outer space as such, except for the prohibition of weapons of mass destruction. Whereas with regard to celestial bodies, Article 4 is much stricter. Any military activities are prohibited there. In addition, there are two often neglected articles which basically provide for some kind of transparency and confidence building measures avant la lettre. Article 10 provides for a limited right of states to observe the launches of other states in order to try and make sure that none of the above is violated thereby. 
And likewise, Article 12 of the Outer Space Treaty provides for a limited right of states to visit stations on the moon or other celestial bodies of other states in order to make sure that not any, that no inappropriate activities are taking place there. So that still is not very much. Let's talk about the general principles of outer space law, which still may have some indirect bearing on military use. The first one, the most important one, is the prohibition on territorial sovereignty in outer space. You can plant your flag anywhere you want, but it can never mean that outer space or part thereof becomes part of your national territory. Closely related to that, Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty posits the freedom of activity for states as the baseline legal rule. Limitations to that freedom can only be imposed in the international law by treaties and customary international law. And this is essentially a reflection of the age old uh, Lotus principle, which states that the limitations on the freedoms of states to act internationally cannot be presumed. You have to point to a specific legal source accepted by that particular state in question. A third principle talks about astronauts and considers them the envoys of mankind, which means that states have to treat them with a certain degree of respect and support. Uh, there's Article 6, which has already mentioned, which provides for state responsibility for national activities in outer space, including obviously in principle military ones. There's a twin principle dealing with liability, which is uh, found in Article 7 of the Outer Space Treaty and further elaborated by the Liability Convention. And also this provides, at least in principle, we will come back to that later, also in a military context. There's Article 8 of the Outer Space Treaty, which together with the Registration Convention provides for an obligation to register objects in launch into outer space and then provides the registration state with jurisdiction over that space object on a quasi-territorial basis. This is very similar to the classical flag state jurisdiction over ships or aircraft, with the added caveat that in space, the jurisdiction also extends to personnel of that space object, even if it happens to be outside of the space object itself. And the last general principle I want to quote here, it has already been briefly discussed, comes from Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, which calls upon states to act with due regard for the interests of other states in outer space. And though it doesn't provide for any hard and fast obligations prohibiting the creation of space debris or obliging everyone to create, to clear up their own mess, at least a good faith effort is required to keep space as clean as possible. And all of these principles obviously have some bearing on the, uh, on the law of armed conflict or the military uses of outer space. But summing up, we are still not stuck with a lot. What you can clearly see is that outer space is very much premised on the peaceful uses of outer space and the hope that these uses will remain peaceful. The Outer Space Treaty presents a major effort to minimize chances of armed conflicts. But once they would actually erupt, it provides precious little legal guidance on how to handle such conflicts. Now, that was all good and well until basically now. Yes, it's true that two, two decades ago, the Gulf War was hailed as the first space war. But if you look at it a little bit closer, space was mainly used as an ancillary tool for fighting the, the fight down on Earth. Space infrastructure was used for communication, navigation, uh, guidance, and uh, reconnaissance. Um, but this was all ancillary to the terrestrial conflict, and that meant that the UN Charter just applied as it used to be. Uh, if a state um, was uh, using armed force in violation of the Charter against another state, then the use of space technology in that context was also prohibited and vice versa. When uh, a state was entitled to self-defense, it could obviously use its space infrastructure in the service of that self-defense. So you didn't need that much beyond existing uh, law of armed conflict or more specifically the UN Charter as recognized by the Outer Space Treaty. But that of course is now changing. We've heard ample indications of that today and yesterday. For the first time, the threat of a conflict in outer space starts to be looming in a serious manner. And that means that we now suddenly have an elephant in the room. And the elephant is the present reality of military use of outer space, 
which could of course give rise to then armed conflicts and all the devastating effects has never been really addressed by outer space law. So let us look then to the law of armed conflict and see what that has to bring us. The law of armed conflict, by contrast to space law, is premised on the reality of armed conflicts. The reality that states, whether we like it or not, occasionally wish to use armed force or the threat thereof to advance their perceived interests. And then, of course, the law of armed conflict tries to limit that reality, tries to limit the eruption of armed conflict as much as possible, and if they nevertheless erupt, try to limit their disastrous effects. So in that sense, it seems to be much more geared to the upcoming threats that we are all considering discussing these days in the conference. Now, the core of the law of armed conflict is even more difficult than with space law to, to describe. It is centuries, if not millennia old, and as a consequence, it, it, is combined, it combines many constitutive elements. Traditionally, a difference was uh, usually made between the use ad bellum and the use in bello, uh, but since the borderlines between these two uh, doctrines have become increasingly difficult, current discussions tend to shy away from using those terms. Other terms are introduced, such as international humanitarian law, but that whatever they exactly all uh, comprise, they certainly are all part of the law of armed conflict as I defined it before, namely with reference to trying to limit the use of armed force and the unfortunate effects thereof as much as reasonably possible. But it's more than just, just this. There are some regimes called the law of neutrality, to which I will come back in greater detail, or, or the law of prizes or the law of targeting, uh, where some people even contest that there is a real law at issue here. It's maybe just a bundle of rules, but be that as it may, they certainly form part of the law of armed conflict. And then I also include in this the treaties prohibiting the use of certain categories of weapons because they all try to limit the unfortunate uh, disastrous consequences of armed conflicts in terms of humanitarian suffering and all that. So because of the complexity, it is also evident that contrary to space law, which we can somehow all funnel back to the Outer Space Treaty, the law of armed conflict consists of many sources. Some of the most famous ones are the treaties which have been agreed more than a century ago, uh, less than 20 miles from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, since 1945, of course, the UN Charter is a pivotal document in, in this whole context. And a lot of uh, discussion also pertains to the application of the Geneva Pro Conventions and the later protocols. And then, of course, there are many more treaties, often with a special focus. And it's not just about treaty law either. We have a lot of customary international law in the area of uh, armed conflict as well. So this whole huge body of, uh, of LOEC seems to be much better prepared for the future. Well, unfortunately, there is an elephant in the room here as well. And I apologize, elephants are my favorite animals. And by the way, this is distinctly not a political statement. The elephant in the room here is the absence of armed conflicts in outer space so far, which means that if we look at it closer, the law of armed conflict has never so far really included outer space in its scope. If you look at the law of armed conflict, LOAC has traditionally focused on three separate domains. The first obviously being the land domain, and this domain is ruled by the concept of territorial sovereignty. So much of it, much of the LOAC on land is focusing on what belligerents can do in their own territory, in the territory of the other belligerent, or in territories of neutral states, subject to this issue of, uh, of, of uh, sovereign uh, jurisdiction and territorial sovereignty. And the Hague Five Convention is a great example of that. Obviously, the second dome, and then, of course, territorial sovereignty does not apply in outer space. So we cannot simply transpose these rules to outer space. The second domain is the domain of the sea, where a small part of it is also ruled by territorial sovereignty, but most of the LOAC on maritime issues focuses on the areas where there is no territorial sovereignty, and as a consequence, it addresses such issues as the sovereign immunity of warships. And again, 
The Hague 13 Convention is an excellent example which focuses exclusively on warfare at sea. Now also here we should conclude that sovereign immunity of warships and any other rules of the law of the sea do not simply apply to outer space by their mere existence. A warship cannot be simply equated to a satellite, to give just one example thereof. The third domain is of course the air domain, which is ruled by a mix of territorial sovereignty and the absence of territorial sovereignty over international airspace that has been enshrined in the Chicago Convention of 1944, and that also then determines the scope of the UN Charter or any other LOAC which talks about attacks to a sovereign territory, for example. And neither territorial sovereignty nor international air law apply to outer space. So the question is, what is left for outer space as a domain in this respect? Well, luckily, there, is, there may not be any domain-specific law of armed conflict, at least yet, but that doesn't mean the score is entirely zero. There are at least some parts of LOAC which are non-domain-specific. Some UN Charter obligations on armed attacks and the right of self-defense, as we've seen, apply regardless of uh, whether space is involved in the armed attack or the right of self-defense. General principles of law act as discrimination, proportionality, and responsibility would apply to uh, fighting in outer space as well, although it then is the question, how shall we interpret them? What criteria, thresholds, and yardstick which we would use to determine whether these principles are complied with? Again, we cannot simply transplant the yardsticks and the criteria from the law of the sea, uh, maritime law act, or land-based law act, or anything like that. We could add some general principles of, of international law, such as Pacta Sud Servanda, uh, but that still leaves us wanting for more. So what I'll do in the next couple of slides is address a few overarching principles of LOAC, which do not so much take space into consideration as such, but may still be relevant as well. First of all, LOAC always tries to limit the justifications for the use of armed force. And for example, the UN Charter, uh, within the context of state-to-state -state conflicts, provides for only two generally recognized exceptions to the prohibition on the use of force that is self-defense, and that is collective action under the UN Security Council's guidance. Likewise, LOAC undertakes a lot of efforts to limit the use of specific arms, which are considered uh, atrocious or especially uh, anti-human, or armed force methods. Obviously, the Chemical Weapons Convention is a good example thereof. These are perhaps obvious uh, examples, but less obvious perhaps is this one. A very important third principle concerns the distinction between those who fight and those who do not. Even if they may somehow be engaged, some may have actually placed a bet on one or the other, uh, some may just be onlookers, and some may just be worried about where the fight is going. And the law of neutrality, if I may use that term for a moment again, uh, determines uh, a lot of rights of the two groups vis-a-vis -vis each other and within the groups as well. So that is very important to realize. We'll come back to that in greater detail. Then a fifth overarching principle of LOAC is to try and protect various categories of persons from the harms of the use of armed conflict. That ranges from combatants and prisoners of war to the civilians, both of the uh, belligerents and of the neutral states. And likewise, LOAC tries to protect various categories of what I would call assets for want of a better term, which again ranges from hospitals to other non-military targets to uh, trade, uh, trade items such as medical or food supplies to contraband. Anything is regulated by LOAC as to whether it deserves special protection against the use of armed force. But every time the question is, how would these apply? We cannot simply assume that they apply in outer space in the same manner as they apply on land or on the sea, precisely because there is also something called outer space law. And this overlap of uh, regimes is basically a recipe for incompatibilities. And an armed conflict in outer space thereby is not only a conflict between two opponents, but it's also a conflict in many respects between two legal regimes to determine those rules. <laughs> 
Let me try to illustrate this by using six uh, scenarios. So the first scenario is an armed attack on a satellite. Now, if you, on the one hand, we have space law, which provides for the absence of territorial sovereignty in outer space, whereas space objects can only qualify as quasi-territorial subjects. The law of armed conflict states that there is no use of force allowed against the territorial integrity of a or political independence of another state under the UN Charter, unless as per the two accepted exceptions of self-defense and collective action. So the question now is, does an attack on a satellite constitute a use of force under Article 2, Paragraph 4, and thereby being prohibited by the Charter? Or might it merely be unlawful under another, more general rule of international law or LOAC? I'm leaving this cliffhanger for a moment and we'll come back to uh, a, a, an effort to answer it later on. That, by the way, applies to the other scenarios as well. So I already warn you in advance for that. The second scenario follows on from this scenario. An armed attack may well trigger the use of force in self-defense. On Earth, a very logical consequence. In space, we have space law, which again states that uh, there is no territorial sovereignty, no, no national territory, space objects are not territory, so maybe this does not justify self-defense. Because the law of armed conflict also focuses on the right of self-defense against an armed attack against a UN member state, entailing the use of force as necessary in that context. So the question is here, does an armed attack on a satellite indeed trigger the right of self-defense either under Article 51 of the UN Charter or beyond that. And what would that mean? Would the attacked state, for example, be entitled to retaliate against the territory of the attacking state instead of to one of its satellites? Scenario three also follows from scenario one. And in this case, the armed attack is successful and damages the targeted satellite. So the outer space law provides that states are liable for damage that they cause in outer space and that without compensation, without limits to the compensation. Now the law of armed conflict on the contrary obviously allows any assets that are part of military operations against an opponent to present perfectly legitimate targets for the use of force. So the question is here, would a state really be obliged to pay for the damage caused to another satellite, if that satellite presents a legitimate target in the LOAC. Sense tells us no, but there's a little bit more to it as we will come to later. Scenario four talks about astronauts. An astronaut engages in military operations in the context of an international armed conflict. On the one hand, we have outer space law requiring astronauts to be treated as envoys of mankind, which means that they should be helped if they're in distress and repatriated to their home state as soon as possible. On the other hand, the law of armed conflict states that if you find a combatant of an opponent belligerent, you may well use force against that person and certainly take that prisoner, that person prisoner of war. So if an astronaut qualifies as a combatant, is he or she indeed a legitimate target for use of force and for uh, being taken prisoner of war? Or should he or she still be helped as the true astronaut that he or she claims to be? Scenario five, a state launches military space objects, possibly then for use in an armed conflict. The Outer Space Treaty and the Registration Convention talk about the obligation to register them and provide some key information. While of course it is a sort of self-understood rule of the law of armed conflict that states can do anything to keep all their military activities secret and even disguise them as long as they don't use the Red Cross to cover military vehicles or things of that nature because those are specifically prohibited by LOAC. So does that mean that a state is obliged to provide basic information on military space objects launched, which obviously they would not like to provide to their opponents? And the last scenario I want to briefly discuss goes to the moon. The moon becomes involved in a conflict between two states, which may escalate into an armed conflict. Now, as we've already seen, there is no territorial sovereignty on the moon, so no state can do what it wants as if it is their own territory. And further than that, Article 4 has been seen to prohibit military activities of any kind on the moon. 
On the other hand, the law of armed conflict doesn't provide for any such limitations. It only limits basically the use by belligerents of neutral states territories uh, to certain extent. I won't go into the details. Most of you are more familiar than, than I am to those, but that's of course what LOAC is all about. It doesn't address limitations to uh, the use of force by belligerents in international areas. But does that really mean that a state uh, is allowed to undertake military op operations on the moon, in particular if using armed force, or is that really a prohibition under outer space law? So to solve these and other incompatibilities, and I could go on for hours if you let me, we should now turn to uh, uh, some of the tools that international law offers us to address these incompatibilities. And actually the first tool of sorts is the UN Charter itself. On the one hand, it is recognized as part of outer space law, if you will. And on the other hand, as we've seen, it is a cornerstone of the law of armed conflict. And seemingly article 103 seems to solve the issue because it provides the obligations and the, the charter override any other international obligations. But the problem is that the UN Charter only applies within its own scope of application. The UN Charter does not change quasi-territory of a satellite in outer space into territory for the sake of legal definitions under uh, Article 2.4. And therefore, an attack on a satellite is not use of force in the sense of Article 2, Paragraph 4. It may be use of force in any other sense, but that's, uh, that's not what Article 2, Paragraph 4 talks about. And likewise, as a consequence, an attack on a satellite, at least as far as Article 51 is concerned, would not trigger the right of self-defense. So at least with the first two scenarios, to some extent, we have a solution here now, although as you can already can hear from my careful formulation, it is far from perfect. So we move on to another tool, the rules of treaty interpretation. And here's, of course, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaty, which luckily helps us out. Uh, for this particular purpose, I want to focus on one clause in Article 31, which states that if a normal reading of a treaty clause would lead to a result which is manifestly absurd or unreasonable, because it cannot reflect what part is really meant when they signed that uh, signed up to that clause, then we should reinterpret that clause in such a manner that we can uh, accept that parties, states, sovereign states really signed up to such an obligation. So following the intention of state parties, obviously you cannot assume that states accepted that they would have to pay for damage caused to a space object of an enemy in a case of an armed conflict. As long as they qualify as legitimate targets, this rule apparently is overruled by the LOAC rule that you can try to harm your opponent's assets. And likewise, you cannot assume that states really were willing to treat astronauts of an enemy state as, uh, as an envoys of mankind instead of treating them as combatants and possibly prisoners of war. But while that at least partially, at least prima facie, would seem to solve scenarios three and four, it still leaves a lot of problems unsolved. Because it would mean, if you would take it that far, that the rules of outer space law on liability for damage and on treating an astronauts as envoys of mankind would be basically become irrelevant. As soon as an armed conflict erupts, no astronaut is protected anymore. No liability is due for the, viol for the damage caused to any satellite. And the same kind of discussion, uh, once you go deeper into the matter, you will find with respect to many other rules, the avoidance of harmful interference, insistence on peaceful use of outer space, etc., etc. And this is where the concept of neutrality comes in. And of course, the first question is then, what is neutrality? Let's first look at treaty law, but unfortunately it doesn't give us much of an answer. Uh, if you look at the Hague Convention 5, yes, in the preamble, it desires to define the meaning of the term neutral, but then it doesn't really do so. It then in the operative articles only focuses on neutral persons without exactly defining what neutral is. Presumably that was somehow self understood. <laughs> 
Likewise, if you look at uh, the Hague Convention 13 on, on maritime warfare, it speaks about the relations between neutral and belligerent powers. So it's clear that there is a dichotomy. You're either neutral or a belligerent, but it doesn't explain what the guiding line, the dividing line between the two is. And likewise, the preamble then at least provides for a general duty, an admitted duty, as they call, to apply these rules impartially. That gives you a little bit of a clue, but I still think it's fair to say that there is no real definition in treaty law of either the concept of neutrality or that of neutral state. So fortunately, we have a number of experts who have thought about these issues. This is a definition coming from the web. Miriam Webster, to be precise, a refusal to take part in a war between other powers is supposed to be the definition of neutrality. Lieutenant Colonel Wolf, in his uh, final thesis for the LLM program in Nebraska, defined neutrality as non-participation in a conflict and non-discrimination between belligerents. And in an older article, Professor von Heineck talked about the attitude of impartiality again, adopted by third states towards belligerents. And I underlined third states because I will come back to that particular word. So following from these definitions of neutrality, we could probably define neutral states, and at least Professor Hynek has indeed done that by saying that states that choose not to participate on behalf of either party to a conflict are supposed to be neutral states. Now, the so-called law of neutrality um, actually refers to all the rules addressing this complex situation in many scenarios, on land, on sea, regardless of the vein, et cetera, et cetera. Which means that the reality of neutrality is that it's not a simple dichotomy. As a matter of fact, in today's globalized world, there are few states, and I'm not even talking about their commercial operators, which is another layer of problems, but there are few states willing and able to severe all ties with whatsoever with belligerents to really, truly, totally stay out of the conflict. That is almost impossible. Look at this picture. Take a look at those guys. Some of these may indeed be uh, secretly uh, vouching for one or the other or may have placed money on them. Others are interested bystanders or some are just concerned about the fight erupting into more harm. And all of them do not participate in the fight. So in other words, we should probably think about neutrality as a bundle of sticks. And that's of course a concept that all American lawyers should be very familiar with in a different context, but I think it is very helpful here as well. Because neutral states then have a bundle of rights and they may some lo lose some of these rights and still not use, sorry, still not lose their true neutral status only if they go beyond a, a certain number of rights, if they lose too much and they hardly have a bundle left, then they become allies or even belligerents themselves. But it's important to realize that all neutral states may be neutral, but some are more neutral than others. So if you look at neutrality, in some, it still means that each state has a sovereign discretion of the extent to which it wants to be involved in an armed conflict, and then accepts willy-nilly the legal consequences of whatever that level of involvement in the LOIC means. And this reminds me very much of the age-old concept of pacta tertius, which of course basically means that if two states conclude a treaty, a treaty obligation, that third states can neither be bound uh, by the rights nor by the obligations therein without their specific consent. In other words, each state with regard to treaty law and that applies also to customary international law with a few exceptions has the sovereign discretion to determine what obligations it wants to accept and what it does not accept. So in other words, if we now sort of merge the two concepts, we can state that with respect to any armed conflict, a neutral state is any state not itself party to that conflict. It's essentially a third state, as Professor von Heineck already uh, hinted at. And such a third state cannot be drawn into an armed conflict, cannot be uh, ex uh, understood to accept all the obligations resting upon belligerents, uh, or the rights that belligerents may claim to have vis-a-vis -vis each other under LOAC, except to the extent that it has consented. And that, in my view, will solve many issues. 
I took a crack at the uh, remaining scenarios that were still out there. So if we look at scenario three, belligerents may well be entitled to not compensate the damage they caused to satellites of an opponent belligerent, but they are still obliged to compensate damage caused to third states because third states and the liability convention are simply entitled to that. They have nothing to do in that sense with the original conflict. Likewise, belligerents may, may take the astronauts of an enemy state prisoner, but they may certainly not do so with regard to astronauts of third states. And also, if we address the, the two last scenarios, we now come to a clear solution. Belligerents are still obliged to provide the required information on space objects registered and launched, since this is an obligation ergo omnis. It's not just towards the other belligerent in the LOAC or towards a specific neutral state. It is to the global community as a whole, meant to clarify how we should all uh, uh, try to make peaceful use of outer space. Now, of course, the, the requirement to information uh, to provide information is anyway severely limited. So in that sense, you won't need to give away too much military secrets. But we should also recognize that the liability as a launching state still remains in place. Otherwise, the all of space law would basically become irrelevant, true paper law. And as to the last scenario, belligerents in that, under that analysis are still obliged to desist from using armed force on the moon and other celestial bodies, even against their opponents, because again, this is an obligation ergo omnis. And we have all agreed on the Outer Space Treaty to try to protect the use of the moon as the province of all mankind. Now, these were just a few examples, of course, and there are many, many more, and most of them are much more complex and, and complicated than the one I sketched here. So to come to my concluding remarks, to the extent that non-domain specific LOAC does not address relevant scenarios, we need to develop probably domain specific LOAC for outer space. Whether we do that in extension of existing LOAC treaties or customary international law, or as extension of the outer space treaty, which has already mentioned, I believe by Ken Hodgkins and maybe others, earlier before is an open question, or we can also probably consider this to be a third hybrid regime or a new legal regime altogether. Likewise, the applicability of non-domain specific law still needs to be clarified. It is all good and well to say that distinction and proportionality apply to outer space, but they should mean something totally different from distinction and proportionality when it comes to hospitals or, or armed bases on earth or uh, on the high seas. Well, this is where the Woomera manual come in. We are working on it. So in the Woomera manual context, uh, there is an ongoing analysis of the applicable of exist, uh, applicability of existing law to space, noting that space law continues to have a relevance there as well. How do these two interact? and then map the resulting gaps, and then provide some suggestions, the most reasonable applicable uh, principles of international law to fill the gaps. But we should ultimately realize that it's not for us to fill the gaps, it's for the states through state practice, opinion juris, guidelines, and maybe at some point in time treaties to do so. Nevertheless, I'm still hopefully that the Woomera project at some point in time will replace the question mark with some profound exclamation marks. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention and obviously I'm open to questions. Thank you, Professor von der Dunk. That was very fascinating. Um, we do have some questions and so I'll encourage everyone if you wanna upvote particular questions you wanna ask. We have very limited time and a lot of questions. So I, I wanna prioritize those questions uh, that people want to be asked. So to begin with, uh, Professor, we have a question from uh, Christopher who asks, um, the US DOD guidelines notably require that to the extent practical, US military aircraft operating under international airspace uh, observe flight procedures from promulgated by ICAO. Um, even though technically they are not, they're expressly uh, provided to not have to comply with this. Considering the DOD's voluntary compliance with ICAO rules in this regard, what are your thoughts on the perspective role of ICAO in spaceflight and its impact um, 
I lost my point. I lost my point. On military activities. That's an interesting point. While I applaud uh, the approach taken in the case of airspace, uh, I do not honestly think that ICAO currently is well equipped to deal with spaceflight. There are certain elements of what ICAO is doing which we can make uh, benefit, uh, beneficial use of. But I think uh, even apart from the, from the more formal hurdles that so far ICAO has never been given the, co been given the competence to address outer space, uh, I think there are much more practical consequences as well. Airspace is uh, relatively simple in the sense that uh, most airspaces of the world are uh, subject to national jurisdiction, uh, which leaves, of course, the international airspaces over the oceans. But there is a clear common ground, not so much for military purposes, but basically for commercial purposes, to accept certain international rules on the international airspaces. And then ICAO is mandated to serve as a kind of guardian on behalf of all these states to handle those in a very efficient manner. I don't think it's going to work that way in space. And, and a good example is space traffic management. Of course, uh, there are elements of air traffic management which we can make use of. But there are so many different elements when it comes to space. Uh, think about the fact that the overwhelming majority of, of, of things floating in space is to start with unmanned, or, or I should say not guided by humans, on board. Uh, and much of it is actually unguided at all because it's space debris. Um, and, and where the whole air traffic management system, for good reasons, is geared towards telling pilots what to do in a certain situation, uh, it is not geared to tell ground operators uh, to do uh, what to do with uh, unmanned satellites uh, or let alone what to do with space debris. So it's just an example. I think we can learn a lot from ICAO, but I think ICAO is, it, itself, and it has actually recognized that I should add as well, in terms of suborbital flight, it has looked into the matter and said, well, there may be some issues which would make us seem appropriate as the international organization to discuss suborbital flight. But so far, we, uh, we, we stay away from that. Thank you, Professor. Uh, another question, and this goes to one of the scenarios and the conclusion that you drew as a result. Um, it says, uh, regarding an attack on a satellite, the ICJ has accepted uh, that warships and flag vessels may in principle be the subject of an armed attack. They are emanations of the state, giving rise to the right of self-defense. Would the same logic not apply to satellites? Even if not, while such, such attacks might not constitute the threat or use of force against the territory integrity of a political independence of any state, they would still be acts inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nation, which is also part of Article 2.4 drafting and would breach Article 2.4 and give rise to self-defense under Article 51. As to the last part, uh, I do agree that obviously uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that you're allowed to attack another satellite. I, I do think, however, that uh, there is more to it than just applying Article 2.4 and reading it as if it is attacked to a, to a political... Uh, it is certainly not territorial integrity. It might be political independence, although that raises a whole a host of other arguments. Um, and what was the first part of the question? I'm sorry. Oh, absolutely. So uh, basically, the, the question asks, uh, the ICJ has accepted that warships right, and right. vessels uh, yep. give, can be attacked and give rise. So wouldn't the same thing apply to satellites? It, it could. I, I understand the logic. Um, although uh, with when it comes to attacking another warship, if you succeed in destroying it, the, basically the only country that suffers is the country whose warship that is, and of course the people on board. Whereas if you destroy a satellite, you create a, a bunch of space debris which may harm all the other satellites as well. And that is a major operational difference between the realms of the, the maritime realm and the outer space realm, which tells me to be very cautious in simply transplanting this principle one-on-one. -on -one. Another issue, of course, that uh, uh, in, the, in the old uh, approach to uh, the law of, of, of warfare on the, on the high seas, it was usually clearly visible whether something was a warship or not. Um, there were even some rules pertaining to that. Uh, 
granted there have been sometimes use has been made of ships that didn't look like warships and were nevertheless used in, in, a, in a military context but i think again that in the context of space the situation is much more complex and in the previous panel for example reference was made to satellites being provided by commercial operators where part of the use was by military oper uh, by military clients other use might have been by non-military clients the use of military clients might not have all been in the context of armed force, the actual armed force. It may have been simple communications between various branches of the armed forces, things like that. So again, I would be very careful in just transplanting this one-on-one -on -one from the traditional context of the law of the sea and armed conflict on, on in maritime domain to outer space. Fair enough. I think that was a great answer. Um, another, and this is somewhat related question, is there a parallel between the international treaties concerning space and those which govern Antarctica? You had mentioned neutrality, and so I was just curious if there are some uh, parallels there. Uh, there is, but I would say mainly with regard to the to the to the legal context that uh, Antarctica, just like the Moon and other celestial bodies, is is basically demilitarized, if you want to put it that way. The difference is, of course, that no one has so far shown a real substantive interest in the military possibilities of Antarctica, at least not that I know. And so far, luckily, that has applied to the Moon as well. But as we, I'm afraid, must all agree these days, that is. Uh, possibly rapidly or at least gradually changing. And, and that means that uh, also uh, linked to that, if you, if you link that to the economic possibilities to do something there in Antarctica, the possibilities to undertake economic activities has, to the extent that it was possible in the first place, has been basically stifled by the number of treaties that exclude, uh, for example, mineral exploitation. On the moon, that is an open question. And we now see the beginnings, possibly, of a race for the space resources, which may in inevitably trigger potentially conflicting interests. Competing for these valuable resources may, in the end, also result in military conflicts. And that is a major factual difference between the law of, of the, or the Antarctic situation and the law on outer space. But yes, there are many, uh, many similarities which we can probably learn from. Great. Um, moving to the next question, some uh, Michael Listener suggested a scenario. He said, if a state changes or ignores the rules and claims national sovereignty of the space above its territory to justify the use of force in outer space against a space object belonging to another state, if the principle of non-sovereignty is abrogated, wouldn't the principle of liability also be ignored? Um, that's a great question. My, my first answer would be not necessarily. I mean, the two have been separated to some extent. Uh, liability applies also to damage caused in some other state's sovereign airspace. Um, it, it even could apply in your own airspace or uh, on your own territory to the extent that foreigners who are not uh, privy to the launch are still uh, giving rise to a title to claim in the liability convention of their home state. Now, that's kind of a special scenario. Uh, but going back to the original scenario, what I want to point out is that the liability convention simply bases liability on the fact of being a launching state and then that launching state space object causing damage. And whether that damage occurs in outer space, if you uh, under the scenario that Michael uh, suggests, uh, claim that extension to be up to, I don't know, 40,000 kilometers to include the geostationary orbit, as it has, of course, once been tried by a few countries, that still doesn't change the, the application of the liability convention. And it may, to, to answer the other part of the question, it may throw out the rule of Article 2, but not just by one state ignoring it. I mean, at this point in time, there is no question about the validity of the prohibition on uh, national appropriation of uh, any part of outer space under Article 2. And all the important countries have signed up to that, and it's customary international law. Now, again, that doesn't need to remain so forever, but it certainly does, re uh, does require that uh, at least the major states of the world agree that this rule somehow is updated which I personally hope they don't agree to, because I think it raises the, uh, you know, it, it raises the chance considerably that, that uh, conflicts will erupt. But who am I, right? 
Fair enough. I think we have time for one more question, and I wanted to get a little bit more general. And so Sarah Guthrie asks, uh, has there been discussion or is there discussion regarding the colonization of the moon and eventually Mars and how states will govern and defend once scientific permanent, in quotes, I think that's important, residents are established on other planetary bodies? So far, I think this has only been discussed in, 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 in academic terms or, or, or close to academic circles. Um, I should maybe point out that the word colonization is, is tricky. Um, if you take it in the factual sense of establishing uh, uh, habitats, then sure, that has been discussed all over the place, uh, not just by governments, but also by, of course, some, some people like Elon Musk of SpaceX. Uh, and the space treaties basically do not prohibit that. I mean, the freedom of space activities does prohibit uh, the, the development of all sorts of stations and facilities on Mars and the moon and stuff like that, as long as they are non-military, of course. Uh, what is prohibited by the space treaty is colonization in the classical legal sense of the word, because that is exactly what Article 2 is about. Uh, back in the 15th and 16th century, most Western European countries went around the world, put, planted their flags in other parts of the world and said, this is now my colony, you belong to the motherland. Article 2 very fundamentally, so far as uh, going back to the previous question, but still excludes the applicability of that concept to outer space. So legally speaking, colonization is not possible. That means that if you have actual settlements there, it will at some point in time, certainly if they are permanent, raise the question, does that mean that these settlements become their own extraterrestrial quote unquote state? Those are of course very interesting answers. Uh, I sometimes tem am tempted to use them in my exams. I don't know, Timothy, whether you can recall one of those exams. They are beautiful exam questions, but uh, let's leave it at that for the moment. Sir, fortunately, I was uh, lucky enough to get uh, a fairly um, fair exam. <laughs> All right. Well, Professor Von Drug, thank you so much. Uh, that was a, a pleasure. It was wonderful to be uh, to watch you present again. Uh, thank you very much for everyone. Uh, we're going to go on a short, just a three to four minute break. We'll be back at uh, 1430. Thank you. <laughs>